thank you, Gautam, for that, uh, for that introduction and for the parallels that you've drawn. Uh, moving on from the parallels that exist and the relations that exist between uh, Israel and Latin America and Israel and India, uh, it would be great now to move on to what are the ways in which we can coalesce to fight this. Important amongst those being the call for military embargo against Israel given by the BDS movement. And uh, I'd just like to point out that last year in the light of, uh, of the killings in Gaza, even Amnesty International has endorsed that demand. So to say that it's becoming increasingly popular. And I would now hand over the floor to Marin to actually talk about this demand and how we can work around it. Thanks a lot. And it was really interesting to hear the contributions from Pedro and Gautam and uh, shocking at the same time to see how uh, uh, what we are experiencing every day in Palestine, whether that's a targeted killing of activists uh, or uh, the surveillance systems are really every day happening and being exported in the rest of the world. Um, Evidently, the what to do question is always the key question when we are when we are talking about these things. And uh, pa the Palestinian civil society has actually given us the tool to uh, work uh, effectively to make a significant change in all of this one. In fact, in 2005, uh, when uh, Palestinian civil society uh, and over 170 organizations representing Palestinian refugees, Palestinians uh, under military occupation in the West Bank and Gaza, and Palestinians, uh, citizens of Israel, but uh, completely disenfranchised in an apartheid system, have come together and have called for boycotts, divestment, and sanctions, and have launched this global uh, movement that uh, has been uh, modeled on various experiences, boycott experiences from India to the U.S. civil rights movement to others, but very much uh, has, be, uh, has been inspired uh, and developed in encounters with South, Amer uh, South African activists uh, that at that time were struggling against the South African uh, variety of, uh, of apartheid. And within that framework of boycotts, divestment, and sanctions, i.e. the call to cut ties of complicity that is empowering people to work at home to stop uh, uh, Israeli apartheid, the question of a military embargo is absolutely key. It is key because uh, military uh, and military ideology is evidently at the heart of uh, Israel's uh, regime of apartheid. And because evidently without the weapons and the technology methodology around it, Israel couldn't continue to do what it is doing. Uh, it is as key as well because it's an absolute no-brainer. I mean, it should be absolutely evident. It should be absolutely self-evident for anybody that uh, wants to stand up to a minimum of ethics, to a minimum of respect for human rights, that going and providing weapons... Uh, to Israel, who are buying weapons that are coming out of that laboratory of apartheid that is Israel, is simply wrong. Um, but I think the important part uh, here is as well to understand two key uh, aspects of the military embargo, especially when we're talking about the global south. Many people are thinking that the question of a military embargo is something about ending U.S. military aid to Israel and uh, uh, U.S. military support to Israel. Evidently, we have to work on that one. But I do think it is absolutely fundamental to understand that actually Israeli military capacity would not be possible without the Global South. 70% of uh, its production uh, in the military sector is for export. And this export does not go to the U.S., this export does not go to Europe or to a very small percentage because in those countries, in those regions, they're the big military uh, companies that will defend their markets with every, everything they can. Those weapons, those uh, technology go to the global south. India last year has bought 49% of all Israeli military exports. Brazil, Colombia are other big buyers of that one. 
So what one needs to understand is that that is a key aspect of military campaigning that we need to stop. It cannot be that the people's, uh, people in the global south, with their tax money, because it's their tax money, are financing Israeli occupation uh, and at the same time paying the price uh, uh, on their own skin as well. So I do think that's an important part to understand. An important part to understand, and Peter was already saying that as well, is uh, that we're not only talking about uh, contracts uh, uh, on a federal government level, where many uh, of us uh, are in the global south uh, going, like whether that's uh, the Modi government in India, whether that's the Bolsonaro government in India, how, how are we going to talk to these people if we even want to talk to these people, but to convince them to stop military relations? So that looks like a kind of mission impossible. But when one understands that Israel's military is not only about war, but has entered in all spaces of society, then one can understand as well that military embargo campaigning can be pretty close to home, because that uh, means that we have, on the one hand, cities uh, and uh, state governments directly involved with Israeli military companies, whether that's in the forms of police training, whether that's in the forms of public security contracts, whether that's in the forms of cybersecurity contracts, uh, uh, and uh, whether that's in the forms of technology parks. Israel more and more in the global south is working on joint ventures together with military companies in the global south within a framework of growing privatization as well of the military sector, which is another problem that we may want to, to tackle. So we have Israeli companies very close to home in our technology parks, and we have uh, uh, Israeli military companies in our universities and research centers. Whether that is developing high tech, whether that is developing uh, the uh, ideology and the doctrines for it, uh, all these uh, issues uh, and all these uh, technologies and tools are pretty close to home, even if you cannot convince uh, your Congress or your government. And I do think, uh, just to give a couple of examples, uh, uh, we have shown that it is possible. Uh, the idea to say military embargo is the last thing we can achieve. Maybe sometimes it's the first thing we can achieve. For example, in Brazil, the biggest uh, and first uh, victory was a military embargo campaign. And Pedro can maybe talk a bit more about that. Uh, it was a, a campaign on Elbit Systems. But Elbit Systems uh, today has, uh, or two weeks ago, has just... Uh, uh, seen another big uh, impact of the BDS movement when uh, HSBC, one of the biggest banks around the world, uh, has uh, given in to the pressure of the BDS movement and has decided to divest uh, from Elbit Systems. And it's not the first bank. Since 2007, we're working uh, on the divestments uh, from Elbit Systems, and there are over a dozen uh, among uh, the biggest banks and the uh, uh, pension funds around the world that have already divested from, from Elbit systems. Police training. If one thinks that the, wor the worst thing uh, to do is trying to build up a BDS movement in a country like the U.S. under Trump, I can tell you we have victories on uh, the level of local councils in the U.S. where local councils have decided that their local police is not going to be trained by Israeli military or security companies. Um, so it is possible. It is possible to achieve these victories. And the question is, how do we build up the alliances so that we are strong enough uh, uh, to actually achieve uh, uh, steps forward in, in this sense. Um, and I guess uh, it is, uh, when you're talking about these alliances, it's important to understand as well that uh, uh, considering that uh, our political situation almost globally is getting 
dramatically worse. And the question of militarism and defense of human rights defenders, protection of human rights defenders, is unfortunately becoming ever uh, bigger a concern around the world. We do have a common ground with people around the world uh, to join uh, the struggle. It is important we work together. We don't see this uh, question of a military embargo as only a Palestine solidarity issue. It is a global issue. It is an issue of human rights around the world. And in this sense, I guess uh, we can continue to create victories. And uh, I hope we can see as well very soon uh, a few uh, steps forward uh, and victories uh, in India and uh, in Latin America. It's overdue. We continue with a bit uh, more victories as well in that sense. I leave it here yes. for now. Thanks. Thanks, Marin. Uh, Pedro, if you could talk about a few of the uh, victories and also how to organize around this question uh, as your experience has been from, from Latin America. So, thanks a lot, Marin and Gautam, for your interventions. Um, yeah, I want to start where, where Marin left, you know, the, the idea that it's actually possible, that we actually can have an impact. I think this is very, very important in the context we are all living now. Uh, you in India with the Modi government, we in Brazil with the Bolsonaro government, in the extreme right, uh, right rising everywhere, it is important for us to see that our movements are actually uh, having an impact. And military embargo proves that. And uh, before I share with you some um, concrete experiences around it, I just want to bring a very uh, quick reflection on why. Why this is actually effective. Why this is the way for us to go. Um, and the reason is because this is how real solidarity works. I'll tell you in the case of Brazil. Um, at the same time, the Brazilian government, during a progressive government, recognized the Palestinian state, which one could consider a very interesting act of solidarity, that those same governments were the ones that converted Brazil into the fourth or fifth uh, biggest Israeli arms importer in the world. So in one hand, you say something. In the other hand, you're doing a totally different thing. And the Palestinians have been very clear to us that what they need now is not charity, is not discourse, or not more declarations. What they need is concrete solidarity. And that means, first, hearing their appeal, hearing the oppressed. It's not us from Brazil or from India that are going to tell Palestinians how to pursue their freedom, justice, and equality. We should fight with them, not for them. And that means hearing their appeal. And their appeal is clear. We must cut ties of our governments, of our organizations, with complicit companies and with the Israeli uh, government and its regime of apartheid, expansion and colonization. And military embargo is a central thing on this. The other reason why military embargo is so effective, it's because it's connecting our struggles. You could ask me, but Pedro, how come people in favela that are worried with their lives every day under brutal military actions and brutal racism that affects black and poor people in this country are talking about Palestine and are mobilizing for it. And, and Gautam uh, could, um, could uh, prove that what I'm saying is true, that because he saw that in, in the meeting we organized in Rio, where mothers of people that were killed by the military police were leading the whole process of denouncing Israel's connection to that. Because fighting for military embargo and answering the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanction for them is not only a principled matter of supporting the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. It's also a matter for fighting. It's also a matter of fighting for their own rights. For that, no, for that, less kids will be killed by the police using those technologies. For that, our society won't get more and more militarized with those partnerships. So, and we can't undermine the importance of these connections. And this is what our oppressors fear most. Because it's not something that we're doing because we believe it's good to do. We're doing this because this is the only way we can pursue our social and just struggles. Our oppressors are already connected. Uh, 
it's not a matter of believing it. It's, it's as we said, numbers and contracts and companies. The same companies are affecting us here and there, coming from Israel. So if we don't connect ourselves, we lose that struggle. And third, and with that, I'll give you some concrete examples. Through connecting our struggles, we're actually achieving concrete results that have an impact on Israel and its economy and the military system as much to the point that they are trying to stop our movement and criminalize BDS and stop military embargo to grow even more. Um, the campaign that Martin mentioned uh, around Elbit in Brazil is a clear example of how these three elements, hearing the call of the Palestinian people, connecting our struggles and having a, an effective impact, uh, can be put into place. Um, that agreement uh, only felt because of the mobilizing of different sectors of civil society in Brazil that understood that that was damaging for our own reality, but also responded to the Palestinian goal. Trade unions, students, social movements, feminist movements, parties involved in different governments and the coalitions uh, at that time, they all realized that that was a struggle we had to take together. And uh, that campaign managed first to break uh, an academic side of the agreement. And then here we, we can see the importance of the students mobilizing around it. That agreement had part of it that involved universities in the south of Brazil. And those students managed to mobilize and uh, they were denouncing that their tax money in a public university was going for a, a partnership that produces the knowledge on how to repress people instead of an, an, an emancipatory knowledge or knowledge that is useful for Brazilian society. Then we had to show public actors on how that money was being put in a place that wasn't really where it should be. Billions of dollars going to a deal with a foreign military company while the country has several economic internal crises a lot of priorities around social inequality, and even uh, companies in the military sector in Brazil are uh, facing challenges uh, in the global economy, and that money was being put into a foreign company. So we had to show public actors how that wasn't even a reasonable thing to do in their own rationality. And this is really important for us to understand how military embargo campaigns work, and how they can be actually implemented. I mentioned to you different examples of other companies, and uh, I'll use G4S as an example of another campaign for us to, to make this reflection a little bit more concrete, and with that, I'll conclude. Uh, G4S, as I said, is involved in violations and against Palestinians, but it's also involved in the privatization of, the, of, of private security around the world, incarceration of black and poor, in the U.S., uh, private security in different countries in Brazil, uh, detention of migrants in Europe, detention of migrants in South Africa. It's a company that's involved in different uh, human rights violations. All of those people that felt somehow violated to by the by, by that company and the, and all different allies around the world got together in this company, bringing these connections into light. And this is the reason why Jupiter has lost so many contracts. Because when we were campaigning against G4S, we were not talking only about what G4S was doing against Palestinians. We were also denouncing that G4S was responsible for the privatization of prisons in the U.S. or that G4S was violating workers' rights in Uruguay to the point that the workers from the union inside G4S, the workers from the company, they passed a resolution saying that we should support the campaign against that company because they're violating their rights as workers, several uh, questions in Uruguay, because they are promoting a monopoly of the private security sector in that small Latin American country, while at the same time violating human rights in Palestine. So these connections can, can appear vague if one doesn't see how concrete they are and the real impacts that they have on companies such as G4S that lost so many contracts and had to leave the prison system uh, that was incarcerating Palestinians uh, in Israel. So when we see that, 
we realize that if we connect our struggles and if we strategize, if we do our research, if we find a good aim and we work until the point that we break that one deal, and after we break that one deal, we find another deal to break that other deal. Uh, because sometimes when you're doing this type of struggle, it comes to our mind that, you know, it's impossible. As Madeline said, you know, there is no, uh, no chance that we're going to uh, convince uh, Modi to not have military relations with Israel. But that's not how campaigning works. We need to be, we need to be strategical and choose maybe local targets or maybe cooperation agreements that doesn't involve money because they're easier to break but they will bring as much as damage to those companies or even more sometimes because of the uh, because they will damage their image, because they will uh, stop future contracts to happen. So let's find targets, local if needed. Let's find partnerships with universities. Let's find different ways that we can build up the strength that will accumulate for a comprehensive military embargo against Israel's apartheid. Let's work with students' movements and see if uh, universities are connected to, to partnerships or to companies that are connected to this. Let's pass resolutions with those students' movements that will then convert into action and campaign that will actually break those agreements. Let's work with unions because workers in the private security sector are also suffering a lot by those companies. Let's work with feminist movements that can see the impact of militarization in women's and queer lives. Let's work with social movements and land, uh, landless movements, um, the small farmers movements that see the impact of militarization uh, in their daily lives from not being able to access their land or from losing that land to uh, securitization of spaces as we see in Brazil, as we, as we see in India. Uh, so when we see mothers in Rio who lost their children joining mothers from Palestine in this struggle, for me, leaves no doubt that we are stronger than our oppressors. They might be uh, even reacting strongly against our movement specifically because of that, because they are afraid that these connections have the power and they're proving to have an effective impact against their system of oppression. So I think military embargo is a very concrete example of how efficient uh, our solidarity can be and how it's needed that we connect our struggles in very specific, concrete BDS campaigns that we design with strategy and with uh, an alliance that talks about the different struggles that are involved uh, in these uh, systems of oppression and that brings into light how Israel is connected to these different processes. Um, I have no doubt that Union India face a lot of challenges in mobilizing in general as we face in Brazil. But again, when we have a concrete campaign, it has been proved to us that it's the most efficient way to mobilize. If you have a concrete goal, one contract to break, people have a reason to go to meetings. People have a reason to be there every day and once that contract uh, is done, is over, people actually see a concrete contribution to a larger struggle. Of course, we're not ending uh, oppression and militarization in India by breaking one of those contracts, but we are challenging that system in a very concrete way. And we are showing to people that it's actually possible to have victories in a world where the extreme right is growing so fast. Thanks, thanks, Pedro, for those experiences and those very concrete uh, examples which we, as we are starting our work on this in India, could really uh, learn from Gautam. One way of getting, uh, uh, taking up the issue of military embargo may be, since most of the military companies that have joint ventures in India have it with the large corporate houses, which are already in disfavor in the public imagination for a variety of reasons. Um, and these are multinationals because these are they have operations outside India too. Yes. And they raise a lot of money from international capital market. Exactly as it happened in the case of Sterlite, where people could lobby hard and get the, the investors to back down from investing yes. in Sterlite Corporation, which was uh, wrecking the lives of uh, indigenous people. Similarly, there are many large corporations which have large operations even outside India both in terms of raising of funds as well as 
maybe when we are targeting, for instance, Elbit has a tie-up in India with one of the largest uh, corporate houses, which is very, very close to the right-wing government in power right now. Uh, it's called Adani. Adani is already uh, a notorious company in Australia where the Australians have been campaigning relentlessly against them being given coal mining rights in Carmichael uh, and some other areas too, Tasmania too. The point I'm trying to make is it's a, perhaps a joint effort where we target the joint venture partners who happen to be Indians, but these are multinational corporations yeah. with international linkages if we target them. That is one thing that struck me when I was listening to the two of you. The other thing is where I take off from what Maren said, and I think that's the single most important point for us to consider, that the divide between war and peace, the difference between war and peace has blurred under the name of subconventional operations and under the name of the disguise of, uh, under the guise of fighting terrorism, which has no it's something so diffuse now, and they're saying that it operates, that it's actually the more dangerous during peace times than even in war. That in war situation, you can handle this better, but in peace times, it becomes much more difficult. The point I'm trying to make is that this, this blurring of distinction and the permanent war-like situations that operates today, where the police is arming itself and getting more militarized, and becoming more adept at firing, shoot to kill, then they are at controlling crowds, maintaining peace, detecting crime, preventing crime from taking place. It's taking on a role which is very, very disturbing. Maybe when, if we were to focus, I'm just loud thinking, maybe if we were to focus in India to raise this issue in this manner, we might be able to bring in the question of military embargo against Israel in a far more effective way than we have hitherto been able to. I'm just thinking aloud. Maybe we have to be more innovative in terms of doing things and carrying them out in a country like India, where there is support for Palestinian people. There is no doubt about it. And this is noticeable even in the fact that the, even the most extreme right-wing government which is in power is compelled to at least hypocritically to pay homage to the Palestinian people and their struggle, which is because of the weight the 70 years weight of support, I mean, the support that India has lent to the Palestinian cause. But this is whittling down and it's, 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 and the relation with Israel is growing. Maybe we have to therefore think and become more innovative and bring in the Indian element in this equation to, 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 to start a campaign or to, to make a campaign more vigorous and robust uh, across the country and also get a lot more support than we have been able to generate so far. And again, targets like um, uh, like HP, for example, become um, a part of, as campaigning has shown, uh, for example, what HP does uh, in terms of its uh, registering of IDs, uh, in terms of colonialism, it has its uh, facility in illegal settlement. It's been involved with the Israeli military. Now, that's a target that is very appealing. And at the same level, it builds the grassroots demand for military embargo, as we're saying that it is something that doesn't start top down, but actually bottom up. So uh, targets, uh, even for our campaigning, range from something like HP to actually even G4S to the fact that people in, uh, in Tutukuri have already been protesting against against Vedanta mm -hmm. and that they have been uh, attacked in that process by a police trained by Israel. I mean, and actually when, uh, um, when, when that happened in Bangalore, there was a demonstration organized together uh, talking about, uh, Marin was there talking about Vedanta and HP, talking about corporate impunity and violence. Uh, and, and I guess uh, the bottom line in all of this is that it's, it's uh, we couldn't, we will never reach a point where experiences are absolutely photocopied. But mm -hmm. it is patterns that are similar, it is powers that are similar, and, and as was said earlier, that if our oppressors are so united, it's high time that our resistances also came more united. Thanks a lot, uh, Marion, Pedro, and thank, Gautam for yeah, today. And thank you, Okumba, and thank you, Marion, and thank you, Pedro, for this occasion to interact with them after a break of seven months. Pleasure. Pleasure, thank you. Thank you for watching People's Dispatch. Cantar, que vamos